Ed, how old were you when you went into the military? 18. What was it like being a teenager starting out in the military? Well, it was uh, quite a culture shock to say the least. Uh, the draft was in effect when, when I joined. So I, I figured I'd be drafted eventually. So I just went ahead and joined to uh, get my, my service over with. And uh, like I say, uh, coming out of high school and going in the Army was uh, quite a culture shock to say the least. Did anyone in your family have military experience? Yeah, um, it goes all the way back to the Civil War. My great-great-grandfather was a Confederate soldier. And he joined uh, the uh, Confederacy, uh, Confederacy in, uh, in Georgia in uh, 1862. And uh, he served, and then two of his brothers uh, were Confederate soldiers also. And one of them was uh, wounded and died of his wounds in a hospital in Alabama. And the other one was paroled. And my great-grandfather was paroled. Back in the, uh, you know, the, they were at war against the United States. So when the war was over, they were just paroled instead of prosecuted. And then my uh, grandfather was a World War I veteran, and he was uh, wounded in uh, France. And uh, then uh, my dad was Career Army, and uh, he, uh, my dad was in the Second World War and Korea, and uh, he uh, was uh, killed in an automobile accident in Germany in uh, 1964. And you went in in the 60s. What was basic training like? Well, back in those days, it was really uh, quite severe because uh, now you have to be politically correct. Uh, a lot of things that you do, but back in those days, uh, it was definitely not politically uh, correct. I've seen a sergeant uh, uh, slap people upside the head and and uh, punch them in the mouth and just all kind of different things uh, when I was in basic. So it was pretty severe, but when I was in basic, uh, they built a wall in Berlin. And our basic was uh, cut from uh, eight weeks to six weeks. And then after basic, you go into what they call AIT, Advanced Infantry Training, and that was cut short from six weeks to four weeks. So in, uh, in that length of time, we were combat ready because when they built the wall, we didn't know what was going to happen as far as we were concerned. Describe for me, if you will, what the environment was like at that time. Well, uh, you know, it was just, uh, when you go through basic, you just go through a, a host of different things. You uh, learn how to fire weapons, and you uh, go through classes, and teaches you the uh, correct procedure to do various things in the Army, and went to uh, combo classes and just, uh, you know, just uh, every day it was uh, uh, from uh, can to can, just about. Uh, and I took basic in, uh, in Fort Riley, Kansas in, the, uh, in uh, July and August, just about the hottest uh, time of the year you can, uh, you can uh, do anything there. So uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty hectic to say the least. What year did you go to Germany? I went to Germany in 63. Uh, and came back in 64. Uh, the 1st Infantry Division uh, has uh, five infantry uh, battalions in the 1st Infantry, uh, infantry Division. And uh, each of the uh, infantry battalions uh, went to Germany. And they had a, an airlift that uh, airlifted us uh, to Germany. And there were a lot of people that went. So uh, they had uh, I think a uh, troop transport jet to uh, leave uh, the Topeka Air Force Base in Kansas, I think every half an hour for uh, oh, 15 or 16 hours, I think, to transport us all to Germany and all of our baggage and all that stuff. So, uh, so we got to Germany and we were only supposed to stay six months anyway. It was just a, an exercise to, I think, see how fast they could move troops from point A to point B. And uh, so we uh, first got there, and uh, we went to uh, an old base uh, in German it's called Wilflecken, and English is Wildflecken, and uh, it's way out in the boondocks, and uh, that's where they trained the SS troops in World War II, the German SS troops. And we stayed in the same barracks the German soldiers lived in World War II. They're big stone buildings, and. Uh, the USO building now is uh, what used to be the German Officers Club. 
and there was a lady, German lady there, that was a secretary for the USO, and uh, she said that uh, when she was a young girl, she was a waitress in the German officers club, and she shook hands with Hitler one time when he uh, came to Wilfleckham. <laughs> That's quite a story. Absolutely. And well, I want to get to your transportation to Germany, the uh, story about that, but you were in Germany at the time that Kennedy was assassinated. What was that like? Oh, uh, that was uh, very hectic. Uh, I was watching the movie at that particular time. It was nighttime in Germany, and uh, the sirens went off, and the movie went off, and an officer jumped up on the stage in the movie and said, everybody report back to your units. So uh, we did, and, and uh, I was a driver for the uh, company commander. So when I got back to the uh, company area, the first sergeant uh, handed me the, uh, a little book that's called, it's got confidential stamped on the front of it, and that's what we used to get into the battle group uh, radio network. And uh, well, you have to, uh, they call it authenticate, they tell you uh, two words, and then you look up in the book, what those two words equals, and you give them the, the word, and you're entering the battle group net. So anyway, on the way to pick up the uh, CO um, at what they call the bachelor officer quarters, because they lived on base, uh, there in, in uh, Wildflecken, and uh, on the way, I tried to enter the net, and they wouldn't let me in. So uh, I went and got to where the CO was waiting on the curbside. When I pulled up, he hopped in the Jeep. We took off back to company headquarters, and, and uh, I asked him, I said, what's going on? He said, I don't have a clue. <laughs> so uh, and he tried to get into the battle group net and he wouldn't let him in either. So we got back to the company area and he went in the safe and got the secret book. It's got a secret stamp on the front of it. And he went out and used that book and got into the battle group network. And uh, nobody still knew what was going on. We thought we were at war. And uh, so uh, after, uh, well, after several hours, of uh, just getting ready to go at any moment's notice. Uh, they told us that the president had been shot and we were taking precautionary measures. And then we uh, waited for an innumerable time uh, more and uh, then they told us that he had uh, passed away and uh, President Johnson had sworn in as president. So we stood down and the uh, alert was over. And during that time they issued ammo and yeah, jackets yeah, and everything. Yeah, when we got back they issued flak, uh, flak jackets and, and live ammo and, and the whole shooting batch because uh, on, uh, on base we were never uh, issued live ammunition. We did a lot of uh, war games and, uh, and stuff but we never used uh, live ammunition except when we went to the firing range. And to issue uh, live ammunition on base is uh, something that's just not done. And uh, so anyway, it was uh, quite a, an ordeal. I've always been curious what it's like not to know what's going on. I know the military is really top secret in some of the things that they do. Being just a young kid, what's it like not to know what is going on, not to be told what's going on, just to be told you go here and you go here? Well, that's kind of what you're trained to do, you know. After when you go in, you know you're brainwashed, so to speak, to to do and ask questions later. And so, uh, but we, you know, when we were uh, after we were got back to the company area and we were issued uh, everything to go to war, well, we just uh, talked amongst ourselves, you know, about uh, what was going on, and nobody knew until they told us that the president had been shot, and we were taking precautionary measures. But we, we, uh, we stood around for about, I guess, uh, three or four hours after the alert was called before we even told he was shot. And then we knew what was going on. And we knew we were taking precautionary measures because that would have been the prime time for somebody to attack if, uh, you know, well, well, we didn't have a president, so to speak. But uh, then when Johnson was sworn in, we had a president. And, uh, you know, we stood down and the, the alert was over and we went back to our normal activities. Now, we did have a memorial service for the president the next day in the uh, gym. And uh, there are German soldiers stationed on, in Wild Flick and also on a different part of the post from what we are. We see them, we saw them all the time, and we had a good relationship with them. And there was a group of them uh, appeared at the uh, gym to express their condolences for the uh, assassination of our president.
Now you had another incident on the border of Germany. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about that experience. Okay, we were we convoyed from uh, Wildflicken to Berlin. That was uh, what we were supposed to do, and uh, we uh, got on autobahn. And when we got to the border of East Germany, we had to stop, of course, and present the necessary paperwork to the Russians and uh, to uh, let them know that we were authorized to be going where we were going. And it wasn't uh, anything unheard of for a convoy to go through there. It wasn't done every day, but it still wasn't unheard of. Uh, anyway, this uh, Russian officer, for some reason, uh, had a uh, wild hair or something and uh, told us that we everybody had to get off their vehicles and had to count them one by one. Well, our person in charge of the convoy told them that's not going to happen. So uh, we sat there for six hours uh, and, uh, and they finally let us through and we went on through and, and uh, got on the road to uh, on the Autobahn in, in East Germany. That was uh, kind of kind of weird. You're, driving down Audubon and you know you're in, in East Germany and uh, something happened, you know, uh, where are we going to be? Uh, but anyway, nothing happened, of course, and we got to uh, Berlin and went through Checkpoint Charlie into uh, American territory and uh, then when we came out, we went through the same procedure. We, uh, we came out and went into uh, East Germany and we convoyed back to Wildflicken and uh, there we uh, turned our vehicles in and uh, then we were bused to uh, Frankfurt and got on uh, planes and flew back to the U.S. And you got out of Germany, I believe, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, prior to the Tet Offensive? Oh, uh, yeah, a long time before because, see, when I was uh, in Germany and even before I got, uh, got out, there were no American troops in Vietnam except uh, the advisors that went over occasionally. They had uh, they had officers, uh, mostly captains, that went over uh, to uh, Vietnam, and they were advising the uh, the uh, South Vietnamese Army on uh, various uh, techniques, you know, you know, battle techniques. And they were only over there for about six months, and they rotated them back. So uh, the whole time I was in, there was no one in uh, in. Uh, Vietnam, except the advisors, there was no big push. And uh, I was, uh, I'd been out uh, right at a year when the first division, which I was part of, went to Vietnam. And that's when it really got started, was in June of 1965. And I got out in June of 64. Now, it's my understanding that during the Cold War, you guys were issued some armored boots and nets and everything like that? Yeah, when uh, when the Cuban crisis uh, happened and Kennedy told Khrushchev to get the missiles out of Cuba, well, uh, we were issued uh, uh, jungle boots and mosquito nets and uh, uh, right next door to the 16th Infantry, which is uh, uh, part of the 1st Division, uh, is the 28th Infantry. And uh, they were going to be the first ones in, I guess. And they were, had already removed their patches from their uniforms because when you go into combat, you don't wear any unit designation to designate what unit you're from in case you're captured. They don't want the enemy to know uh, who's, uh, who's where. And it's my understanding that the leaders even remove any sign that they're in charge because they might possibly be the first ones to be killed? Yeah, that's what I understand. Yeah, the officers don't, don't display their insignia. Uh, uh, I don't, don't display it flagr flagrantly anyway, uh, because they would be uh, an ideal person for a, for a sniper to, to uh, hit. Yeah. During all of this time, what did you do to sort of pass the time when you're sitting on a convoy for six hours, when you're sitting at the base? What did you guys do to pass the time? We always had things to do, uh, being a, uh, a driver for the, for the company commander. Uh, I was on, on call all the time during the day in case uh, he needed to go somewhere. And, uh, and we just uh, just uh, basically uh, sat around and twiddled our thumbs a lot of the time. In the Army, uh, we had an old saying, hurry up and wait, you know. And, uh, but we had to uh, do maintenance on our vehicles and, and uh, keep them uh, looking sharp and, and, you know, all that stuff. 
And, uh, and since I was on call, uh, my Jeep was on call at the company area, uh, if anybody had to go somewhere uh, on base, uh, Fort Riley is a real big base. And well, then I would uh, carry them wherever they needed to go. So a lot of my day was spent, uh, you know, hauling people around to wherever they needed to go. When you look back on your military experience, what were some things that you took away from it? Hmm. Well, that's uh, that's hard to say because uh, being in the infantry, there's not a whole lot of things that you can take into civilian life, uh, you know, because you don't. Uh, People kill people with bayonets. You don't uh, kill people with rifles <laughs> normally in the United States uh, or when you're out of, out of the service. So that's kind of a hard thing to say. And uh, so, really, uh, I guess if I, if there's one thing I took away, uh, the uh, the idea that uh, that I could be uh, self-sufficient and I could uh, do things. Uh, on my own without somebody standing over you 24-7, maybe. You Definitely know. the discipline. Discipline, yeah. Discipline, was, that was a word I was trying to get out. I had a, a senior moment, but uh, discipline was, uh, was a major thing, yes. Is there anything that you want the younger generation to possibly know about your experience, your time in the military, or even the military in general? Well, you know, there seems to be uh, a, uh, well, of course, this uh, volunteer uh, uh, force now, the Army, well, all the uh, service, uh, services are volunteer. And, uh, of course, we have a lot of people that want to step up to the plate and uh, do what they uh, can for their country. And, uh, and a lot of the younger generation, what really upsets me more than anything else is uh, the disrespect people have for our flag. Uh, we, when we have parades in Brookfield, which we have quite a few of, well then the American Legion leads the parade with the, with the flag, and we have our post flag and our MIA POW flag, and uh, we lead the parade. And uh, when we uh, go down Main Street, uh, well it's just amazing the people that have no respect for the flag at all. They're standing around with their hands in their pockets and and uh, stuff just like uh, there's nothing happening. Now some people do remove their hats and put them over their hearts when the flag passes and, and of course veterans, uh, whether you are, are in uniform or not, you're allowed to salute now uh, the flag. So uh, the veterans, uh, most of the veterans, if there's any there uh, that aren't in parade, they do salute. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, the, uh, the younger generation is not being taught the respect for the American flag, uh, like uh, like we have respect for the flag, you know, it's just a it's just a uh, it's just a piece of piece of cloth. But when you put those stripes and stars on it, it becomes a symbol of the sacrifice that so many veterans made to be able to for to be uh, able to fly, fly that flag whenever and wherever we want to. And be able to walk down the street with the flag. Right. And that's one, that's one big thing, uh, you know, the, the, the younger generation I don't think is just being uh, taught uh, the respect that, uh, that they ought to have. Now, uh, when we, uh, we also raise the flag at the, uh, all the football games here in Brookfield, and when we raise the flag, they play the national anthem. And, uh, and of course, there are a lot of kids there because all the football teams and and so of course the football team's not on the on the field when they play the national anthem but but anyway there are a lot of kids present and uh and when we uh, when i started uh going to the football field to raise the flag when i became commander of this post year uh well i uh, went up to the radio booth and uh told the announcer to be sure to tell everybody that it's American Legion Post 182 is uh, doing the honor guard and uh, for everybody to stand and remove your hats in respect of our flag. Now they weren't doing that before I would go up, I would go up to the booth every Friday night and I would be sure that they were aware that that's what uh, we wanted them to do and they did it uh, and of course that uh, helped a lot in getting people to respect uh, what's going on as far as the military is concerned.